Praise the Lord and good morning to the Mount Horeb Sunday School on Sunday the 16th of June. Thank God for joining us today and our lesson this morning is taken from Matthew 11 verses 28 through to 30. Also Hebrews chapter 4 verses 1 through 11. Our topic is sweet blessed rest and we will begin by giving god thanks in prayer thank you heavenly father for your blessings today for the life that you've given us for the hope that we have of eternal life thank you lord jesus for the rest that is awaiting us in christ jesus lord i pray that you will bless us now that as we discuss your word as we share your word that the word of God can come to life in us and help us Lord so that we will be able to attain that rest by faith in Jesus Christ bless us now in Jesus name amen and so once again greetings to everybody greetings to our pastor Bishop Andrew Landell Lady Coronet Landell Minister Pauline Forbes and all of the saints from Mount Horeb and the saints from Bethel and friends and well-wishers from everywhere. We give God thanks for you today. Our focus verse is Matthew 11 verses 28 through to 30. And it says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And so we give God thanks for all of these things that we are going through at the moment. God invites us to rest in him. So we've got to rest in Christ Jesus. So to rest then is to cease from labor, to stop working. That's one of the kind of meanings or definitions that we could look at when we're talking about rest. When we're resting, we're not particularly moving. So normally you rest. Um, by sitting still. So we're not doing anything. We rest so that we can recharge our batteries. And as humans, we often do that when we go to sleep. When we go to sleep, we rest, we recharge our batteries. So we're ready again to do more work. When we're resting, we are being enabled to do more work we've been supported by God we rest in him so we allow God to work and we take almost a back seat in things to be done the truth for my life is I will accept the rest that God offers so God offers us rest but it's on his terms So we can rest in him if we have faith in him, if we trust in him. I'm not going to rest in God and then still try and work it out myself. The old saints would say, well, you know, why worry when you can pray? If you're going to worry, don't pray. And if you're going to pray, don't worry. So we've got to accept the rest that God offers, but we have to accept it on his terms, the way that he tells us that we must rest. And when we rest in him, we have to have faith in him and trust that he is going to solve everything and work everything out. Come unto me, verse 28 of chapter 11. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So first of all, we notice that there is an invitation to come. 
we are welcomed by God. We are invited by God to come unto him. So when we're coming unto him, come unto me. So it can't be done by my human effort. Come unto me. Not do it yourself. Not try and see if you can figure it out yourself. But come unto me. We're coming unto Jesus so that he will help us. Come unto me, all ye that labor. And labor speaks of work. Work, the toils of life. We are laboring to do things the right way. We're laboring to do the right. We're laboring for the gospel. We are laboring, or the Jews were anyway, back in those days. They were laboring, found it difficult to keep the Sabbath. It was work for them to keep the sabbath so there were so many laws and so many rules and regulations that they had to obey keeping the sabbath actually became a labor a chore a task a, a difficult thing to do we are laboring to deliver the gospel and that's an important work that we have to do. Come ye, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. So we can be labored or laden with the worries of this life, with fears. We can be laden with doubt. Is God going to see me through? Can I get through this situation? Will things work out? And we know the scripture sometimes that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord, to them that are the called according to his purpose. But oftentimes we still worry. And sometimes there's a little bit of fear. Sometimes there's a little bit of doubt. We're laden with the burden of delivering the gospel. And it's not a burden as in I don't want it to carry it, but it's a burden as in uh, it's something that's been placed on us to do. So we're burdened with the gospel. And we have to labor and work to deliver that gospel. Sometimes it's a we're laden with sin. We're laden with guilt. We're laden with regret because we've done things wrong and we can't quite shake it off. But God is giving us this opportunity to come unto him. Everybody that's working hard, everybody that's got a heavy burden to carry. And he says, I will give you rest. So he's going to give us rest from all of the above and everything else that comes with it. There's rest from sickness. There's rest from my nine to five job. There's rest from worries, worrying about the children, worrying about the bills, worrying about the marriage, worrying about my ministry, worrying about my health, worrying about my mental health, worrying about the state of the world. Worrying about what, what kind of world is this that I'm bringing my children into, my grandchildren into. There's rest from bills. There's rest from disagreements. There's rest from a whole host of things that we go through on a day-to-day -day basis throughout our whole lives. Jesus says, I will give you rest. Twenty nine says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And ye shall find rest unto your souls. Take my yoke upon you. So we have two oxen here. And the yoke that goes upon 
all goes across them. And <clears throat> how it used to work in the old days, the ox would tread the ground and maybe drag a sled behind them to help prepare the soil so that you could plant. But you'd have an older ox that would know the way. There's an older ox that's done it for a, a period of time. So the older ox knows the pace of which to work during the day. It's done it before. So it knows that by now I'm going to have to pace myself throughout the day so I can get through the day because I'm not going to be stopping after a, after one hour or after two hours. So if I'm too quick, I'm going to wear myself out. Now, this older ox is often put with a younger ox. Now, the younger ox may be stronger, but the younger ox doesn't know the path and doesn't know the pace. So the older ox now, when the younger ox is trying to steam ahead, the older ox slows itself down, takes its time. And so the younger ox now is kind of drawn back, pulled back so that they can both go at a steady pace to fulfill the work, to fulfill the task. The younger ox may wander from the path. It's going to burn itself out too fast. The younger ox may want to give up when the going gets tough. But the older ox knows if we go at this steady pace, we'll get there in the end and we'll earn our rest at the end of the day. The landowner has got the wisdom to put a older ox with a younger ox because this is really, it's a teaching aid, the yoke. It's a training aid. It's what's used to train the oxen and to get them on the right path to make sure that in terms of physically, there's a, there's a crop, there's a crop to harvest. And what the Lord wants is a harvest of souls. And so Jesus is saying, take my yoke upon you so that you can learn from me. And that's an important element in the Christian pathway is that we are learning from Jesus. And we learn sometimes from being linked to older saints. And I would encourage any um, body coming into Christianity that you link yourself with a sober, older brother, sister, mother, father, and learn from them. Learn the pace that they go. Learn the path that they go. And you'll find that you will get yourself grounded in the gospel a little bit more easily. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. So we have Jesus who came to earth. And he's walked the path that we are now intending to walk. And the good thing is, is he's walked it successfully. He's walked the path. He's gone through it successfully. He was tempted, the Bible says, in all points like as we are, yet without sin. And he wants us to walk the same path that he's walked. Now, God is willing to take the time to train us individually so he wants to train us but we have to walk with him so if we're yoked to him he's walked the path before he knows the pace he knows the path and so when we walk with him when we want to rush too far ahead god slows us down and sometimes jesus walks with us through an individual and it may be, as I said, through linking yourself to an older brother, an older sister in Christ that helped to train us. Now, the thing is, he says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. It means that he's willing to train us and he wants to train us. 
he's going to take the time to train us individually. So I'm yoked to Jesus. I'm tied to him. And if I'm yoked to him, it means I can't run off when the going gets tough. I can't bunk off and sneak off because I don't like the type of work that I'm being asked to do. But it's important to be tied to Jesus. And it's important that my heart is tied to him. I'm yoked around the shoulders because I'm ready to bear a burden. I'm ready to carry something. So the burden is something that they're going to have to carry or they're going to have to pull. And a little acronym or yoke at the bottom here. Young and old knitted in education. And there we have our yoke. Young and old knitted in education, in a spiritual education, so that we learn about Christ. We learn his ways. We learn what it is that he wants us to do. So the first part, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Then he goes on to say, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And we have to understand that meekness is not weakness. Often the world thinks that if you're meek, you're a pushover. You're somebody easy to manipulate or easy to boss around. But the Lord says that he was meek and lowly in heart. And he's higher than us. He's greater than we are. But the Bible talks about, I think it's in Romans, that to um, condescend of men to, of low estate. But he came down where we were. He came down where we were. He is dressed in human flesh, just like we are. Was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. And our key word here is meek. And an acronym for that, meeting everyone with everlasting kindness. Meeting everyone with everlasting kindness. Meek. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. Not puffed up in heart, because the Bible does say that God will not walk with the proud nor the scornful. So the Lord isn't saying that he's lowly, because he's not. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. But he's lowly in heart. He humbled himself. And God will not walk with the proud nor the scornful. Take my yoke and upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Well, rest is found in Christ. It's a benefit. It's a perk of being a son of God that we will find rest. And we have to realize that the rest that we will achieve is not earned. It's not something that we earn. We'll work, but it's still not something that we earn, even though we're working. We may still have to work down here on earth. So, in fact, I would say that we will have to still work down here on earth, but we can find rest for our souls. So the body will still have to work. But our souls will be at rest even while we're on earth. But we are looking for that eternal, everlasting, full rest that we're going to achieve in heaven. And our key word here is rest. And an acronym for rest is rejoicing evermore. Because suffering is terminated. Rest. Rejoicing evermore. Because suffering 
is terminated. Now Jesus talked about learn of me. And we learn of somebody that is a teacher, a rabbi. And one side of the yoke was always for the one that knows the way, the older oxen, the master, the rabbi, the teacher. And the other side was for the student. Now, Jesus is our greatest teacher. The word of God is our greatest teacher. The Holy Ghost is our greatest teacher. And all of those are God himself. God is his word. Jesus said, oh, if I go, I'll come again. I'll send the comforter, the Holy Ghost. So Jesus is in his word. Jesus is in us, in his spirit. He's the greatest teacher that we have. But I've got to be willing to place myself under his yoke. Now, placing myself under his yoke will also mean that I've, I may need to restrict myself. I may need to restrict my movements. I may need to restrict my actions, what I do. I may need to, well, I'm definitely going to need to restrict my thoughts because the mind can wander. I may need to restrict my words, what I say. I'll need to restrict my, the, my heart. The Bible talks about that the heart is desperately wicked. It's deceptive and who can know it? And I'm often going to have to restrict the company that I keep, who I hang around with. Well, I'm going to be the student. Jesus is the teacher. And I must follow his leading. And it's important to note that life has many teaching moments throughout our life. From the cradle to the grave, it's one big classroom lesson. And sometimes we learn the lessons quickly. And sometimes it takes us a little bit longer to learn the lessons. But life is about learning the lessons so that we can be more like Christ, so that we can be obedient to Christ, so that we can be faithful to Christ and achieve the rest at the end. The yoke is an important thing because he says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If it's too heavy, then it's not his burden. If it's too difficult, then it's not his yoke. He says, for my yoke is easy, not difficult, and my burden is light, not too heavy. But the problem is that there are many things that are placed on us when we live this life. And sometimes the things, there are things that we place on ourselves. We place too much emphasis on selves, on what we do, too much pressure is placed on ourselves, too much expectation placed on ourselves. And when we fail, which we will do, if we're leaning on self, we're going to fail. But if we're standing on the rock, if we're standing on Christ, we will be victorious, we will be successful. But sometimes we place too much pressure, emphasis on ourselves. Sometimes we allow others to place too much on us so that the burden is heavy and the yoke is difficult sometimes it's the workplace that puts too much on us and we have to do overtime or instead of being able to go home and rest we're having to work at home instead of having the weekends to rest we're having to work at the weekend well that means then the yoke is difficult and the burden is heavy. And it means then that we're not going to get rest. 
And sometimes we believe that I'll, I'll go on holiday. And so we go on holiday, but we're still not able to rest because we're still thinking about work. Or sometimes we go on holiday and we take work with us. Sometimes it's our families that place too much on us. And so the burden of carrying the family, the burden of working to provide for the family is too much. My parents used to have a saying that says, don't hang your basket higher than you can reach it. And so sometimes we hang our basket a little bit too high because we want to compete with the Joneses. And so we put too much pressure. And so our family puts too much pressure. So we get things instead of trying to get more of God in our lives. Sometimes it's church leadership that places a lot on us. And sometimes maybe too much is placed on one particular individual. Jesus did say that the harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. And so sometimes the burden of delivering the gospel message is placed on too few people because there are so many that don't want to take up the burden. But Jesus said that my yoke is easy. The training that we go through from the yoke, it's easy. It's not difficult. We just follow in the footsteps of Jesus. He's mapped out the steps that we're supposed to follow in. And he says, my burden is light. Whatever I'm asking you to carry, it's light. It's not that difficult. Hebrews 4 verse 1, let us therefore fear, acronym for fear, forever always reverent. So let us always be forever always reverent to God, of his word, of his precepts, of what he wants us to do. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. There's a promise of entering into God's rest that may leave us. Well, his rest now is his indwelling spirit, which allows us to rejoice evermore because sorrows are terminated. Let us therefore fear, let us therefore be reverent always, lest a promise. So there's a promise of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. And how can we come short of rest? Well, we come short of it because of unbelief. Unbelief calls God a liar, says, God, you can't do it. What you said, you're not able to do it. Where there's unbelief, it renders grace ineffective because we can't access the grace of God because we don't believe. Unbelief essentially is, it's sin. And sin is to miss the mark, to come short of the mark. Our faith, reaches up to God. Now, if we have unbelief, our reach then becomes too short. We can't reach, can't quite reach, so we come short of it. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. The early Christians were being persecuted. They were being persecuted by the Romans. 
by society in general and by their fellow Jews because the first Christians most of them were were Jews and so there was a problem because the Jews wanted the Jews were proud people and they wanted to stand up for Judaism but a lot of Jews the early Jews anyway the first Christians were mainly Jewish converts and so being persecuted and going through hardships maybe not being able to work maybe being excommunicated from the synagogue and maybe none of your friends talk to you anymore because now you're following Christ so a lot of Jews would have thought of turning back to Judaism similar to how the Israelites when they were wandering through the wilderness so they're going through the wilderness and they're going to the land of promise the promised land of Canaan and the Israelites go through the wilderness and it comes to the time I think it's in numbers maybe 12 13 where they send out the spies and the spies go to see the land and they come back with the report that the land is good it's flowing with milk and honey they bring back the cluster of grapes that it takes a couple of them to carry the cluster of grapes but then the unbelief sets in because they says well we've seen the sons of Anak and the sons of Anak are there and in their sight we must look to them like grasshoppers and that's what we look like in our own sight we look like grasshoppers so we must look like grasshoppers in their sight so we don't think we can take the land we don't think that god is able to give us the victory in this instance and so they came short of the promise and because they came short of the promise the lord says that they're going to die in the wilderness and not enter into his rest For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. So we've got the word and the word, the gospel, the good news. It's preached. Preached to us. And we also intake the word when we read the Bible, when we study it the gospel, the word of God, the good news that Jesus has come to die for our sins so that we can have peace with God. The gospel was preached. It's preached to us. It's preached to, to others as well. But the word preached did not profit. And when we think of profit now, Probably the first thing that a lot of us think of is money. And we think of, okay, there's a profit. There must be some money involved. But in this instance, the profit really speaks of eternal life. Life with God. Life with the Father. So the profit here is to make me a better person. It's not just merely financial gain. The prophet is to make me more Christ-like. Now, why didn't the word prophet? Well, because it wasn't mixed with faith. Now, once you mix ingredients up, you can't really get it back. If we're looking at the mixture in this bowl here, there would be some flour. There might be a little bit of milk. There might be some sugar. And it's all mixed together. Butter. Now, once I've mixed it together, I'm not going to get back the individual ingredients because now something new is being formed. 
And the Bible talks about until Christ be formed in us. So the word has got to be mixed with faith so that Christ can be formed in us. And the Bible talks about hearers of the word. And the Bible tells us, I think it's in James, that we should not just be hearers of the word. But we need to be doers of the word. The only way we can become doers of the word is because we've heard the word, we've mixed it with faith. And so now we can put the word into action. So the gospel was preached. And just because somebody hears the gospel, they hear the preaching and they may be convicted in the initial stages. But the word preached didn't profit because it's not mixed with faith, because we find that eventually we don't actually fully believe the word of God. But the gospel is here to make us into a more Christ like person. So that Christ can be formed in us. Hebrews 4 verse 3. For we which have believed. Do enter into rest. As he said. As I have sworn in my wrath. If they shall enter into my rest. Although the works were finished. From the foundation of the world. So those that believe. Will enter into the rest of God. But the Jewish children didn't believe. And they made God angry. And we can see Israel left the land of Goshen. And they traveled this red route. Yeah. Stopped at Mount Sinai. Came. And there's a lot of traveling around and around in the wilderness. 40 years and they they do a lot of going around and going around because they didn't believe God so God swore in his wrath they weren't going to enter into his rest because they didn't believe because of unbelief because they doubted that God could do what he said he could do and so for 40 years, Israel wandered in the wilderness until all that generation died off. And the children that they said were going to be for a prey, those, I think it was 20 years and under, those are the ones that made it in. But here's what the psalmist said in Psalms 30 verse 5. He says, for his anger endureth but for a moment. In his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night. But joy cometh in the morning. So although God was angry with the Israelites for 40 years. After the 40 years was up and that generation had died off. The children of Israel, those that were 25 years and under, they entered into the promised land. And so his anger endureth but for a moment. 40 years. He was angry with, with Israel. And then afterwards, when his anger was satisfied, grace and favor and blessings now flow upon Israel. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Now, the, the writer of the Hebrews now is making a link. A link with the theme of rest. Talking about the creation or the seventh day, which was the seventh day of creation, because God took six days in which he created the world, the universe and the, the animals, the sea, the land, the air, the sun, the moon, the stars, the grass, all those kind of things. 
and then God rested or planned to rest on the seventh day. While we're here on earth, we realize that our rest is only temporary. We work sometimes Monday to Friday, and then we rest the weekend, Saturday and Sunday. But then we have to go back to work on Monday. And we work Monday to Friday and we rest Saturday and Sunday. And we do that for usually four weeks of a month. And then sometime during the year, we might get a week or a two week holiday. And we book a break and we fly somewhere exotic. But as soon as the two weeks are up, we know we have to go back to work again. But what God really wants is for us to enter his eternal rest. And so we are laboring to enter that eternal rest, not because we earn it, but because it's a it's a benefit. It's a fringe benefit of serving the Lord, because it's not something that we earn. It's not something that we deserve. And also the writer knows that the rest wasn't just for the generation that he was in now. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein. And they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. So those that were in the wilderness that were 20 years and above didn't enter the promised land. But there were some that were 20 years and younger that would. And there were the children of those that were 20 years and under that would also inherit the promised land. And the writer knows that there were Christians in his day that would serve the Lord, that would be martyred for the gospel, that would live out their lives for Christ. But he also knew that there were generations to come that would also live for Christ. That would also die for Christ. And there would be a rest that would be waiting for them. Verses 7 to 11. Again, he limiteth a certain day saying in David today. After so long a time as it is said today, if ye will hear his voice. Harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief so there is a call for us to come now is the time of salvation now is the time to believe god's word if you hear his voice harden not your heart but take heed right now jesus said it this way and he said behold i stand at the door and knock and he's knocking right now. The promised land was not the ultimate rest. It was a temporary rest. It was a symbol of the ultimate rest. That Israel and the entire world were to have. When we die. We rest from earth's labors. But some that are resting from earth's labors may still not have attained eternal rest. What they may have inherited is eternal torment. And they rest from this world's labors because they've died. And they no longer have to work on this mortal soil. But they may still not have 
have attained eternal rest because eternal rest is in Christ. It's not just because we die. Some people feel that, you know what, I'm better off dying. I'm not having so much um, good fortune in this life. And when I die, everything will be okay. Well, if you haven't died in Christ, then no, it won't. Because you won't have eternal rest. What you'll have is eternal torment. So we must work in order to please God. If we work in order to please him, he will help us to get to that eternal rest. Because eternal rest is only in him. So he says, let us labor, let us work, therefore, to enter into that rest. Not because we are going to earn it, not because we deserve it, but because our job really is to spread the gospel. And we've got to spread the gospel to everybody that we come across. We've got to let the world know that there is a God, that there is a savior for the world. We want to rest eternally in him. So thank you for listening this morning. I'm praying that as we continue in our Christian journey, that we, we're not discouraged to work for God, but we must realize that as we work, it's not because of what we do. It's not because of what we've done, but it's because of faith in him. It's faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on Calvary. And it's his grace and mercy that sees us through. But let us continue to work because God has a rest that's awaiting for us. God bless you in Jesus' name.